My guest today is Eric Lawrence. Eric, how are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm doing great. I'm, it's early and I'm wide awake, so I can't That's complain. Good. What do you do, Eric? Uh, well, uh, I do a, a variety of things. Most immediately, uh, I'm a principal program manager uh, on the web defense team at Microsoft. Uh, prior to that, I was a uh, PM for the Microsoft Edge web browser. Prior to that, I was a uh, developer for Google Chrome. Uh, prior to that, I worked on uh, Fiddler. So uh, I started building Fiddler uh, early in my career and, and went off to Telerik to work on that for a couple of years. Uh, but before I went to Telerik, I was a, a PM on the IE team. So basically, I've been either working on a browser or web technology for somewhere around 25 years at this point. Um, so I do browsers, basically. You're, you're the web guy. That's awesome. And I, I just guy. realized that the last time you were on my show was like five jobs ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think I was still just finishing up at Telerik, maybe uh, when I when I entered, uh, lasted this show. Um, well, I want to talk to you more about uh, web browsers here. I've, I noticed you've got an active blog, and you had something about demystifying web browsers, and it goes into some detail about how web browsers works, and and then uh, links to other things. And I, the first thing I want to ask you is why why should we care, or who should care, how a web browser works? Well, I mean, personally, I just find browsers interesting. Like right. I've tried to work on other things and get excited about other things. But the reality is, is that kind of web browsers and the technology around the web is is where my heart's at as a technologist and somebody who uh, likes, you know, kind of building on, on platforms for the future. Uh, but having said that, I mean, I think browsers are broadly interesting to anybody that's really doing software development these days. And I mean, it's also of interest to people who are interested in things like tech policy and and uh, just kind of understanding how the modern world works. And so browsers went from something that, you know, you kind of did on your PC, you know, part of your, your day to day is maybe you browse a little bit in addition to doing, you know, office apps and everything else to, uh, in many ways, the web is the platform and your right. operating system is uh, hopefully a well debugged set of device drivers that lives underneath uh, your browser. But if you look at, you know, what tasks people use their PCs for, for a very, very long time, using the browser has been, you know, the, the top thing that the top activity that people do on their PCs, uh, particularly related to, to work. Uh, gaming is obviously still pretty big, but um, more and more time gets spent in browsers or using applications that are built on browser technology. So if you look at a lot of the modern cross-platform apps, they're built on frameworks like Electron. And Electron is basically kind of like a web browser in a box that carries its own uh, dependencies. And so uh, I think browsers are just inherently interesting, uh, but I think if you're a developer, they're particularly interesting. And, and part of the goal of the Demystifying Browsers post was really to uh, kind of draw attention to the fact that you can learn about browsers. It's not a black box. It's not something where you have to curse and swear and say, you know, <laughs> oh, it's the stupid browser again. You can actually poke at them and you can understand them. Uh, and so that was kind of the, the point of that blog post. Um, yeah, I think uh, the the thing that I've always thought about browsers, originally they were a way of just serving up pages. They were like a library. You'd check out a page, read the page, and then go on to the next one. And now you use the word platform. Now they're the platform upon which almost all of our work is done. And you know, if I want to play music, I don't have to install separate apps right there inside of the browser. If I want to build to use an application, I, I, I typically I can stay in that browser all day long and do that. Yeah. Um, but uh, uh, I've looked at some of the source code. A lot of these browsers are open source. They published it, and it's enormous. I yeah. it's really hard to make heads or tails of it. What's yeah, where would I so start? That's that is one of the things that I think is intimidating to people who uh, are thinking about you know learning more about browsers is they might you know dive right into the source and it's like you know you've got 25 million lines of, of code uh you know i think 11 or 12 million of it uh in c plus plus for chromium for instance and it's like well that's too much to wrap my head around and, and of course that's not really i think the best way to to get into to browsers and so um having said that i mean there is something to be said for for going to the source code and the reality of the situation is i actually got into browsers uh in in order to see the source code. So I was a program manager on the Office Clipart site uh, circa 2003, and we had a piece of clipart that was supposed to change every single day, clip of the day. 
uh, and it wasn't. Uh, and basically, you know, that was around the time the creation of Fiddler, where you know I really wanted to understand, like, what are the caching headers on this? Are we are we sure that we're sending the right e tags? Uh, and you know, basically, I started building a debugger to understand the web. But but ultimately, the reason that I joined the IE team was I had mailed the IE team and said, hey. You know, I think we're doing everything right with the caching, and, and it doesn't seem to be working correctly. Uh, and the IE team at the time was like four people, and they mailed me oh. back. And they're like, we just fix, you know, zero days. We don't really look at anything else. We're not staffed <laughs> to do that. Uh, and the email signature uh, of the guy that I had emailed was, want to change the world, join the new IE team today. And, <laughs> you know, I was that night laying in bed, you know, thinking about just the the absolute, you know, annoyingness of that of that email signature. And I was like, but you know, I guess that's true. You know, at the time the browser had like 600 million users. And I was like, well, you know, there probably is literally nothing else I could do with my life that would impact as many people as working on the browser. But the key bit was if I joined the IE team, I'd get access to their source code. And so I joined the IE team in large part to understand why our clip of the day was not changing. <laughs> uh, and the approach that I did take for that actually is when I, when I moved over, I literally printed out the source code for the network stack and grabbed a red pen and went through it at night and, you know, circled things that looks suspicious. And ultimately, there were about six different bugs that were causing my clip of the day not to change. And so uh, I worked to get those six things fixed. And then, you know, I told my manager, you know, I fixed the six bugs that brought me here. And, and he, he's like, are you a retention risk now? And I showed him the printout where I'd circled about 100 other things. And I was like, maybe once I fix all these, too. Uh, so, you know, I think that one of the nice things about modern browsers is they are, as you noted, almost all open source. And so you can actually, uh, you know, get the access to the source code without upending your life, changing, uh, changing teams or, you know, otherwise changing your job. You can actually dig into it to the degree right. that, you know, you're willing to and have time to. Uh, and part of the goal of the, the demystifying browsers blog post was to sort of help people understand um, some of the, the components of the browser and how they might approach it. And also, you know, kind of with the observation that you don't really have to go source code first necessarily. There's ways to learn about browsers from the bug trackers, from documentation, from blogs, from design docs, uh, from following people on Twitter. And so there's other approaches. And then finally, you know, the other pieces, there's a lot of people who are like, yeah, you know, I can't really get into browsers because I'm not like a C++ programmer. And the reality is a lot of times, I mean, I have never been a professional C++ programmer with the, the yeah. exception of a very short stint uh, on the Chrome security team when I was a C++ programmer on accident. Uh, More than but, me. But uh, the reality is, you know, even, you know, decades before that, I was effectively working with a source of browsers because it turns out that reading C++ is much easier than writing C++. Uh, and it depends on how the code is written, of course. You know, one of the interesting bits about uh, the IE browser back in the day is, is that the Win INET source code was effectively uh, C. And it was C++, but it was written in the style of C. So you could literally read it top to bottom and basically understand it. Whereas Erlmon, the network stack that IE used, uh, was written in sort of uh, then modern C++. And so it had some rather complicated O hierarchies and mm -hmm. templates and other stuff that didn't necessarily make sense. And it was a lot harder to understand. Uh, but fortunately for folks that want to work on uh, browsers today, uh, the code in Chromium is actually fairly straightforward. And so you may not always understand how, you know, things necessarily flow from component to component, but if you actually just go open a source file in C++, um, you can often read it and you'll see, you know, the magic numbers about, oh yeah, this cache lasts for five minutes and, you know, so forth. And so you can learn a lot about it without even being a C++ programmer. Hmm. Um, browsers have been around for like 30 some years now, I think. Uh, oh, something like that, yeah, about uh, 32 maybe. That sounds right. I remember getting a, a disk from Micro Center, installing one. Yeah. Uh, is this? Um, can you tell me what are the what are the significant changes that are happening in the browser world now? Well, I mean, I think there's been uh, a lot of change in the browser world. And, and one of the pieces that's that's kind of interesting is it's like, you know, you ask folks like, what's what's happening in, on Earth today? And you're uh, too big a question. Your perspective will vary based on where you are and where your interests lie. And so for browsers, you know, I think it's kind of the same. I would say that one of the 
sort of big overriding themes of uh, investments and browsers over the last almost decade or so is uh, the attempt to make browsers more capable as an app platform. And so instead of uh, having, you know, as you mentioned earlier, uh, browsers as a, you know, sort of document retrieval system, uh, building app platforms for browsers such that doing things like, you know, building a mail client in a browser is, you know, no longer the exception, but rather a norm. Uh, and this also leads into some of the very interesting sort of strategic uh, pieces of the browser. There's, you know, in some respects, a battle for the heart and soul of what is a browser. And so there's a contingent that believes that, you know, the browser needs to be a full featured app platform with all the power of native uh, such that you can't build a native app that a browser couldn't, you know, effectively you can build a web app that, that does the same thing. And you don't have to worry about making security choices or decisions. The browser and the platform underneath it will keep you safe. And I think the reality is it's, it's got to be both. Uh, both have their value. And I think that it is true that, you know, security and, uh, you know, growing privacy uh, are reasons why the web has been successful. But I think it's also true that if the web browser doesn't continue to become more powerful, uh, it will always be sort of a second class citizen. And we, we see this most in sort of the mobile world where you have two dominant mobile platforms, uh, iOS and Android, and uh, basically code between those OSs is not compatible. And if you want to do something that's cross-platform, you need to build a web app. And if you build a web app, it can run on iOS, it can run on Android, it can run on desktop. Now that's, you know, sort of the dream, right? Wants to run everywhere. But if a web platform is less capable, uh, then that starts to fall apart. And so that's why you start to see kind of these battles uh, around, you know, is the iOS WebKit uh, requirement? So if you build a browser for iOS, you're required to use WebKit. Uh, but WebKit has some shortcomings as opposed to things like Blink and Gecko. And so the question is, is it OK for, for Apple to make that restriction? And that's when you start to get into sort of global questions where the European Union is now asking that question of Apple in the industry is like, is this a reasonable limitation and requirement? And so, you know, you can easily spin off and spend days just reading about all of this stuff. But often for a developer, they're looking at much more prosaic things. They're like, why doesn't this one API call work properly? Or how do I do something that, you know, I think is important for my application, but it's not entirely obvious how to do it. Right. Yeah, it's interesting you bring in there's, there's actually uh, legal aspects of yeah. how browsers are implemented. And then uh, the the way that um, I or most people look at browsers, they're just a, the utility. They should just work. Uh, we're not we're not concerned with how they work or for sort of whether or not they work, particularly in what we're trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, people like one of the key aspects of browsers is simplicity. And so th this is one of the pieces. So Chrome from the very beginning had sort of four S's of, uh, you know, characteristics that they wanted their browser to exhibit and simplicity was one of them and and that is uh borne out by you know a lot of design decisions in particularly in chromium have been around keeping things simple and making it simple we want a browser to be approachable to from everybody from you know a three-year-old who's grabbed somebody's phone to uh you know a 90 year old who's trying to deal with the fact that so many things are now only available online and so simplicity is absolutely uh you know a key design element of browsers. But one of the pieces of that is uh, browsers are just immensely complex. As I mentioned, you know, 12 million or something lines of C++ code making up a, a modern browser platform with, you know, another 12 million of test code. Um, immense levels of complexity. And so, you know, if you're not careful, that level of complexity effectively impacts, you know, the code itself. And it becomes very difficult and cumbersome to work in a browser because the code is so complex. And so a huge amount of genius uh, of, you know, investment in browsers goes into, well, how do we make working inside the browser as a developer uh, as simple as possible? You know, mm -hmm. there's obviously a limit. It's never going to be as simple as using a browser. Uh, but as someone who's, you know, joining a team as a developer to go work on a browser, how do you become effective without years of ramp up? And there are strategies that have been used in Chromium to, to make that possible. Oh, tell me about that. Uh, you've worked on, what, I think three different browsers you mentioned. Yeah, Chrome, so I, I, Edge, and IE. And yeah, one of so, them, let me just interrupt here, because one sure. of them 
uh, essentially Microsoft decided to punt. There was so much complexity in IE that we decided let's just start over from scratch and not worry about all this backwards compatibility that IE was carrying around with it. Yeah, I mean, basically, uh, shortly after I came back uh, to Microsoft from the Chrome team, actually, in fact, the day after I got back from Microsoft uh, from the Chrome team, uh, I got an email with a proposal of what if we threw away uh, basically our entire browsing platform and replatform to top Chromium? What do you think? And my response was, I think it's a great idea. Um, and, you know, to your point, uh, the the complexity of Internet Explorer was was quite high, uh, but also it was, you know, some design decisions. Internet Explorer code was uh, intended to be backward compatible with scenarios going back decades. Right. Uh, one of the things that I had noted uh, when I first joined the, the IE team and, and print, started printing out source code, you know, I'd find lines in there that were, oh, you know, CompuServe 1.0 beta hack, you know, in the years 2000. <laughs> 2006 or something at this point, and you know, CompuServe 1.0 hasn't existed in a decade. Uh, but you know, there was a lot of lingering code around that people were afraid to touch because if they t they touched it, if they took something out, it might break something else. You know, that hack that was in for CompuServe might actually be used by some line of business application or something like that. And so. Uh, the complexity there was uh, not necessarily just in the source code, but in the ecosystem around that source code. And so uh, within Chrome, uh, there's basically a system of layering. And so uh, the layering system in Chromium is comprised of, uh, there are several different kinds of layers, but the big one is this notion of content versus Chrome. And so the idea of content is uh, content is a section of the Chromium source code, which is intended to be uh, useful for building a multi-process browser. And so if you want to build your own web browser atop the Chromium source code, uh, it was designed with the idea that you would take the content, uh, the content area of the code, and then you would build atop it. And so you could build completely your own UI. Uh, there's hooks out for doing your own kind of dialogues or permission decisions or, you know, basically anything that the user is going to end up seeing other than the HTML markup, you can do that with content. And then the other side of it is Chrome. Uh, Chrome meaning not necessarily the Chrome browser, but really the, the stuff around content. So, you know, the, the UI for the address bar and the back forward button and uh, a lot of the pieces that are related to the specifics of um, the Chrome browser. So things like um you know, decisions about uh, address bar or uh, around autofill and things like that. And, and then there's a third piece, which is components. And the idea of components is uh, components are sort of discrete pieces of functionality that uh, can be used uh, or not, depending on what you're trying to build. And so uh, components are, you know, things like uh, the spell checker or whatever, like things that you can layer on top if you need it or, or not if you don't. Now, the interesting piece about this layering, uh, there's a couple of interesting things. Uh, one is that it makes things way simpler in most cases. If you're building something that uh, is only within a single layer, you don't have to concern yourself with the details of the other layers. You know, If you're building a component, you don't have to worry about what's up in Chrome or what's, what's in content. On the other hand, uh, if you are building something uh, that, that needs to span components, uh, it does become more difficult. And so one of the hardest change lists that I ever landed when I was working on the Chrome team was I was effectively passing a single bit uh, around the browser. And that bit was, uh, I think it was related to whether or not the user had edited a form field on a web page because we wanted the browser's address bar to show not secure in a more bold way uh, if it was HTTP and you had edited a field. And so effectively, I was carrying a Boolean around the browser. Uh, and the code for calculating the Boolean was like one line. Uh, and the, the code for doing something different in the address bar uh, based on that Boolean was like two lines. And then something like 48 files were about carrying that Boolean from one side of the browser to the other side of the browser because it becomes very complicated. There's inter-process communication. Uh, there's a bunch of work that's required to plumb things around the browser. And so that can become a set of complexity. But you know, once you sort of understand the system for passing things around, it does become a little bit more straightforward. Um, one of the other pieces that's that's sort of interesting for, for enthusiasts to understand is there is no requirement that a third party limit themselves to just the content and components. And so, in fact, uh, when we were building the new version of Edge, 
uh, we said, well, you know, content and, and components are good, but we actually haven't had a Win32 front end for a browser since the days of Internet Explorer, and we haven't had one for Mac in decades. You know, the, the Mac version of IE went away sometime, you know, around 99 or 2000 or something. And so we're like, well, if we want to build a browser quickly, we actually need to take the, the Chrome side of the code, too. And so we actually took the Chrome side. And so we started out with a browser that visually looked pretty much identical to Chromium, which is very close to Chrome. And over time, we added a bunch of stuff to that. So now Edge has features like the, the sidebars and vertical tabs and you know a different treatment in the address bar and, and other things that are Edge specific. Uh, but we started out by basically starting from the, you know, using all of the code in Chromium to, to get a head start. Okay. Yeah. If I can summarize what you said, there's a, uh, you started with some base classes, this, this Chromium thing, and then you, everything else is modular. Uh, and yep. so, so you can, you only have to worry about your own component and then any interfaces between the components, between yours and other components, which is hopefully smaller than a big ball of mud, which may yes. or may not have been what IE was. Uh, yeah, and and except for those cross cutting concerns you talk about, like yes. keeping track of whether or not a form has changed across different uh, pages. Yep. And modularity is hugely important and it allows for a variety of things beyond just sort of understandability for the developers. It's what allows you to do things like build Electron, uh, where Electron is not a browser, but is based on web technologies. And by use, by taking advantage of the fact that everything is modular, they're able to do that. And then the other piece of it is it makes testing possible. Uh, and so, you know, testing is hugely important in Chrome uh, and Chromium and Edge. Basically, in order for a platform of that level of complexity to work, you need to have a huge amount of tests. But you don't want to be adding sort of test hooks all over the place and exposed methods that could be abused by an attacker in the browser and, and, and so forth. And so what, you know, the modularity enables is doing great things around unit tests and uh, integration tests and, and things like that, where, you know, depending on how the code ends, ends up getting compiled, you, you have things that are accessible to you and you're able to put in, you know, fakes and mocks and things like that in a very clean way. Uh, so that, that modularity has, you know, an upfront cost and certainly has a design cost, but uh, it does make the day to day within the browser way easier. Yeah, this sounds like there's lessons in here for any application of moderate to high complexity. To yep. Use that same pattern. Before is that browsers are all free to me. How do they pay for all those developers? Yeah, I mean, frankly, it's it's way more than millions. And so that's <laughs> one of the pieces that a lot of people really give no particular level of thought to to browsers is what is the business model of browsers? And they when they even have the vague idea of like, oh, there's there's money somewhere, they don't understand the scale of that money. And once you understand the scale of the money involved in browsers, a lot of things about the design of browsers and the way that browsers compete make a lot more sense. And so, uh, you know, back in the early days uh, when I joined the Internet Explorer team around 2004, there was a lot of sort of strategery around browsers like, oh, you know, we're building a browser because we want to have a great, you know, web app platform on Windows. And the number one people thing people are doing on Windows is browsing the web. So if we don't have a great browser, then, you know, we're, we're going to lose out to the developer mindshare in the future. Now, all of that stuff is still there. There's definitely a lot of platform strategery going on, but there's actually a much simpler economic equation. And that economic equation is, uh, as you can see from public figures from Mozilla and others who, who reveal this information, one point of web browser market share is worth in the neighborhood of 100 to $200 million per year. So if you can manage to get 1% of market share for a browser, you're looking at a revenue stream of 100 to 200 million dollars. And if you're looking at a browser that has hugely dominant share like Chrome, if you compare, you know, Google reportedly paid Apple something like 12 billion dollars a year to be the search platform for iPhones, uh, it becomes very clear that Chrome is, uh, you know, annual impact to Google is in the tens of billions of dollars. And this means a few things. Uh, one, it means they can spend a lot of money on the browser. So there's a huge number of people involved in building browsers because when your budget is measured in the hundreds of millions or low billions per year for development, you can afford to put a huge number of people on the browser. And you can afford to do that because your browser is making 
you know, depending on your market share, multiples of, you know, 100 to 200 million dollars a year. And so there's a huge amount of money in browsers. Uh, but it also means that things like what is the user's search engine become critically important because the search engine is the dominant source of revenue for uh, pretty much all of the browsers. And so, you know, there's a reason why Chrome defaults to Google. And there's a reason why Edge defaults to Bing. There's a reason why Firefox defaults to whoever's paying them the most amount of money in any given year uh, mm -hmm. is that there is a huge amount of revenue there. Uh, and for the most part, it's a it's a good deal for users. They're not paying for browsers. They're getting continual yeah. levels of innovation and in products that cost billions of dollars to make. Uh, but you know their search traffic is super valuable. And so sometimes you'll see a decision in the context of a browser, and you're like, why are they doing that? And the answer is, well, there's a revenue stream, and that revenue stream is is what funds the browser. Uh, that's interesting. I'm, I learned that from reading your article. We're just about at time, but I, I'll put a, a link to this in here and just tell people now that it's, it's at your blog, which is text slash plain dot com, in which the slash is spelled out. Um, and uh, I see you're still updating. This article was written a while ago, but you last updated on December 11th, so you're still adding to even just to this article. Yep, yep. I changed some links. Uh, basically, I try to keep many of the posts on my blog up to date as things change. I just, I made an update. I wrote a post like five or six years ago. I think about using backspace to go back, and literally yesterday I updated that because for the first time in 25 years, I realized that if you hold backspace, you can go back multiple pages at a time. I've literally been using that hotkey for you know 25 years and never noticed that if you hold down backspace, it can go back multiple pages. So yeah, I try to. Keep I'm gonna try page. that as soon as we hang up. It's a flag it's a flag it's off by default uh, uh but the blog post explains why it's off by default so yeah i try to i try to put a lot of browser information on my blog and, and the demystifying uh post i think is a great start for people who want to you know either go deep into browsers or kind of just understand the lay of the land eric this has been really educational for me thank you so much for your time you stay nice safe. talking to you I mean, it's been a, it's been a strange time these last couple of years, and I think the the one thing that has really helped uh, is using technology. To connect with us. I think that you know technology has has kept us in touch with our friends, and I think that's super valuable.